Hey, kids, it's the Drive to School podcast, and it is Holy Week. There's lots of church. You get to go tonight on Thursday. You get to go tomorrow on Friday, Saturday, too. And wait, there's more. You get to go on Sunday. Today marks the beginning of the Triduum, the the three-day service that lasts longer than a festival. It is the Maundy Thursday, Good Friday, Easter Vigil, one service, three days extravaganza where everything comes to a head. Three years of Jesus' teaching lead to this. Jesus begins by washing the disciples' feet on Maundy Thursday. Peter actually tries to stop it because it's it's super uncomfortable for, for everyone. It, it still is. It's uncomfortable to try to avoid doing it because he flat out says that we should. It's even more uncomfortable if we were to actually get a bowl and do it. And that might actually be the thing that it has most in common with what our church argues about so often, and that is communion. Our Lord institutes the Lord's Supper tonight, and that's super uncomfortable too. It's it's uncomfortable if we try to avoid the plain words of Scripture. It's even more uncomfortable if we actually do what they say, but this actually is the body and blood of Jesus for you under bread and wine to eat and drink for the forgiveness of your sins. Like, really, it actually is. That's Jesus' blood, same blood that flows down from his hands and his side on the cross that is for you. Drink it. Seriously. And you have to admit that it's it's peculiar. It's it's peculiar when the funny looking pastor in funny looking clothes holds up bread and wine and says, the peace of the Lord be with you, because that actually shows where to find the peace. It's in the cup. It's in the bread. It is his body and is his blood for you. Eat it and drink it. Whether you believe it or not, it is there. But he would will that you believe it because it's also, it's for you. And it leads people to recoil because, well, we've got better ideas as to how things would work. But love is more than an empty ritual. It's something to mark. Love is more than just a chance to think back about fonder days of the disciples all arguing about who is the greatest and Judas plotting to betray our Lord as he goes out to suffer and die. Love is more than an empty ritual. His supper is more than just a symbol. It is his body. It is his blood. He says so himself. He does not just leave us with teachings and examples. This is not just a chance to reflect upon great wisdom and remember fondly his stories. God was made flesh for you to die and to rise again. And so when God wants you to look for him in the midst of your struggles, in the midst of your trials, in the midst of your frustrations, he also wants you to be able to find him. And so he promises to be in communion, in the body, in the blood, for you. And that makes it easier than looking inside of yourself or just trying to think back, because think about who actually was around during the Last Supper. The disciples hated each other. Peter and John had a grudge that existed for many years after the resurrection. Judas was planning to betray Jesus, and they ate and drank forgiveness of sins. Then Peter went out and denied the Lord three times. John held a grudge all the way through Easter morning. Judas betrayed the Lord. See, communion doesn't stop you from being a sinner. It gives you the strength to look for Jesus when you happen to be one. It gives you mercy, the the, the sure, certain knowledge that he forgives you your sins. It, It matters because this actually then becomes the answer to every bit of baggage that we drag into church, every argument, every pain, every burden, guilt, and sin. We are fed by Jesus to forgive it all. That becomes the source of our unity. That becomes our bond in the church. Not that we all just get along and everybody knocks off doing the stupid stuff. We actually get to see each other how God would see us. We are the ones who receive grace. This call then to wash each other's feet, it's not just outwardly show humility. It's first receive from God and then share the same. That empty ritual, the washing of the feet, it called to the surface everything that was ugly. Peter tried to stop it, but the Lord's Supper actually addressed it. Of everything that we would hide because we're too embarrassed to have God wash our feet, of everything that we would think to prove by washing each other's, of all the ugliness that gets drawn to the surface as Jesus sits around the most awkward, uncomfortable meal ever, he answers it himself by feeding you with his body and his blood. This is Holy Thursday. And then he goes out to die on Good Friday. The hour has finally come for the Son of Man to be glorified. 
he just seems to use the word differently than we do because like our glory days are back when things were better, when life was simpler, when I was good at something, when all you had to worry about was the stuff that you made look easy, when life seemed pretty doable and everything seemed under control and we were seen as mighty. The problem with glory days, that the way that people talk about them is that, well, they're always in the past tense. You don't know that's what they are until they're already gone. But Jesus lifts up his eyes to, seven, to heaven and, and says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that the son would glorify you. The hour has finally come for the son to be glorified. Not when 5,000 folks were willing to follow him days out into the middle of nowhere just to listen to him talk. Not in when he fed every last one of them with five loaves of bread and two fish. Not when water was turned into a wine at a party. Not when he walked on the water. Not when he calmed the storm. Not when he healed the desperate or the sick. Not when he cast out the demons. Not when he resisted the devil for 40 days in a trial of wills. Jesus was glorified. Not in making everything look easy. Not in power, but in mercy. The hour where the sun was glorified was about the third hour, when the sun was blotted out from the sky, when he hung upon the cross to be mocked by his enemies, not in strength, but in weakness, not admired, but humiliated, not in the things that the world respects and we sinners covet, but as he was despised and we esteemed him not. There, when he was stricken, smitten, and afflicted for you, there he won for you eternal life. And there, he reveals something about God that we would never otherwise see. Because that's what the word glory really means. Glory is a loaded word in the Bible. It doesn't mean like cool stuff. When the Bible says glory, it's a word for God's presence. It means that God is actually there. The glory of the Lord is the presence of the Lord. So when the angel choirs saying glory to God in the highest on a Christmas morning there, to shepherds, it was because God was present on earth, laying in a manger. When the glory of the Lord dwelt in Sinai and a cloud covered it and Moses entered the cloud, it was to talk to God who was present there. Where God locates himself, his glory shines. And the cross is more glorious than all of these things because the son was glorified on the cross. That is where he wins for you forgiveness for your sins, for all of them. The ones you bury the deepest, your sins are forgiven because Jesus died for you there. That's what glory is. God is present in mercy, not in power, but in love. This is where God wants to be present, not just like everywhere, but here for you so that when you find yourself lost, when you find yourself empty, when you find yourself devoid of anything good or anything worth loving, you can know that you are loved because the son was glorified. Jesus died. God died for you. And then we'll have to wait three days until Easter. That's Saturday, the last day of the Triduum. Here in Easter Vigil, you'll finally get that benediction because the church service finally ends. It's a wonderful service that's super weird because we wait. We know that he has risen. Everything's white. Everything's Eastery, but kind of quiet. Like we wait while we reflect upon everything else that happened in the Old Testament. Everything else that has happened thus far, we wait. But we know what's coming. I'm sort of like, you know, life. We wait. We know the resurrection is ours. We are baptized. We know that Christ is risen from the grave. We know that we have hope, but it doesn't quite feel like it's there yet. And so we wait. For a Christian, waiting is a joy, even as it is kind of a struggle, because here we get to reflect on more than just the right now. Easter Vigil is wonderful because we get to look back and see promises being answered. We get to look back and recognize that Christ has already done all of the things that he has promised to do. And then Christ rises from the grave and still we wait for that last great day. And it's not just waiting until we get to die and go to heaven. It's waiting knowing that Everything's already been taken care of. And so when the right now seems to stretch into eternity, we get to wait by looking back so that we can look forward and we can realize that all of time and all of space gets sort of crushed together in these three days. But that means that we've already made it through because those three days end in the resurrection. Easter Vigil is the day where we wait, but we know. And so in the rest of your life, we'll wait, but we'll know. Today isn't all there is. What you're going through isn't all there is. There's a resurrection. It's already yours. And so it might be muted a little bit, but there's joy.